Okay, so Amy, mm -hmm. that's a weird spelling, Amy. It is. <laughs> My dad was a bit of a francophile on so, the explanation. A I M E E stands out. It does, and it also shows that even though you seem normal on the surface, there's something a little bit weird. <laughs> well, let's hope we can get to that. <laughs> Uh, Amy Peake has been active in the antiquarian book business for over 20 years. She got her start in the business during her days as a philosophy student at the University of Manitoba as an apprentice to Michael Park, proprietor of one of Canada's premier antiquarian bookstores, Greenfield Books. Now, he died recently. Yes. I purchased Greenfield books from him after he died unexpectedly three years ago. That must have been a shock. Yes, it was. Yeah, I expected him to be around until I took over naturally. <laughs> yes, yes. Until he died nat. Well, he did die naturally, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Sudden, but naturally, yes. Right. So. Can you talk to me a bit about the relationship you had with him? Michael would always say that I was, um, he treated me like he was my uncle. Um, and that was a very specific to him because Michael had a bit of a stern way about him. So um, he wasn't, uh, you know, the kindly doting ankle, uh, uncle. He was the one who um, threw you into the deep end and you would either sink or swim. And uh, I thrived on that, luckily. <laughs> uh, when he opened Bison Books, he just installed me behind the counter and said, okay, good luck. <laughs> and he'd, he'd come and visit most days, but I got to learn how to buy. I taught myself how to do the accounting. I was literally on my own in the store uh, five or six days a week. And so how come he set up another bookstore then? Oh, he was the um, quintessential um, bookseller who couldn't say no <laughs> to the entire collection. Oh, they, these are all such good books. How could I say no to them? And he really only wanted the higher-end stuff for Greenfield books. Oh, I see. So he had a more refined inventory at Greenfield. It was um, on the main floor of a house, um, and it was sort of a semi-private location. And so he needed... A, more general retail store um, where he could welcome walk-in traffic for the general books. So for years he would filter the good stuff into Greenfield and the general stock into Bison. Um, and then we moved and then I bought in and we had a, um, an agreement that I would buy 50% and then three years later I would buy the other 50%. So during, at that time I was able to start keeping the antiquarian stock that came in over the counter. Oh, so he didn't mind that you were competing with him then? I'm not sure you could say that, but <laughs> I think he would have preferred to have all the good antiquarian stuff at, at uh, Greenfield Books, but he welcomed healthy competition. He thought that the more good, reputable booksellers there were, that the better off we were as a society and as booksellers. Um, he that? thought we should cluster because I think if you have not enough booksellers in a city, it doesn't help to keep you honest. <laughs> you know, if you've got competition, you've got to be sharp um, and your prices have to be accurate and you have to treat people fairly and be kind and um, this wasn't describe the... things accurately. Okay, but this wasn't before the internet. No, it wasn't before the internet. So you had the internet to keep keep you fairly honest. <laughs> right, but even in terms of what you pay or how you treat people right. who are bringing books in I to see. sell to you. Yes. Um, you have to make sure that you're treating them with respect and consideration. I because see. Because there's Not... another guy down the street. Yeah. So if you want them to come back to you and if you want to have the good inventory, I understand. you have to make sure that you make people want to come back to you. Right. So you're not ripping them off. Right. Or um, just being too too brusque or, you know, he always said you have to explain your your rationale. There would be a miniature seminar every time he bought books from people. You know, this is what I'm buying and this is why I'm buying it. This is what makes it interesting. 
um, and this is how much I can pay. Can you give me a little example of that? Uh, if someone brought in three boxes of books, say, the first thing we do is we sort through them, um, separate the wheat from the chaff, and then uh, we go through the short list. What's the wheat and, and what's the chaff? Well, the chaff is the stuff we don't want. No, no, I understand. <laughs> you can take it back with you. I'm get, I want some specifics, though. Some if I can. specifics. Um, like, for example. Well, if I've got mid list fiction that every book club was reading 10 years ago, nobody wants that anymore. It's everywhere. Right. And everybody's already read it. And you're not so going to be I'm able not to sell interested. it. I'm yeah. not interested. Okay. But if they've got um, a first edition on Dachi that's signed, that's the wheat. Um, okay. Or something that is still well read, uh, that's a classic, like an Orwell, nice Orwell trade paperback, or something like that that's still readily saleable. So, signed what? What would you classify on Dodge as? Just as uh, he continues to be popular among buyers and book lovers because the market still finds him relevant. I would say. I hate to be too cute about it, but really it comes down to supply and demand. You have to know what the customer is looking for yeah. and whether or not it, there are a glut of them in every second-hand bookstore or thrift store that you go to. Uh, so you have to keep on top of trends, consumer trends. Okay. What's another example of what he would say in one of his typical seminars, why I bought it? Well, it's not always just why I bought it. It's also why I paid such and such. Like not enough. Using the example of the Andachi, um, yeah. one of his early books, say, or um, if it, if you're looking for a negative aspect, there might be a condition flaw. Yeah. Um, or something that needs to be restored or um, a dust jacket that needs a road art cover, a, a cost that he's going to have to add to what he actually pays for the book up front. Yeah. Um, so he would delineate all of the specifics, sometimes um, more so than others, depending on, on what the books were. You know, And sometimes, I, I, I still do that with people. I will make piles. These, this is the general shelf stock. Yeah. This is the stuff I'm buying sort of at a bulk price, and then these are the things that are a little bit more refined that require individual attention, um, and that I might tell you about individually if you're interested. Who continues to sell for you? I don't think there's any magic to that. I'm right near a university, so I can sell Whatever. philosophy all day, right. classic novels, okay. um, those kinds of things. There's there's nothing in particular. I mean, in terms of Winnipeg books, I can always sell traditional Ukrainian cookery, um, <laughs> which is a book that was published in Winnipeg that went through many editions. And I had a copy in a few weeks ago, and I sold it within 24 hours wow. and it's a hundred dollars all day long unless you have a nicer edition which might be a little bit more than that the odd um internet bookseller who's not as familiar with this particular book as i am might try to charge a lot more for it but i don't think that that is um doing the community a service it's but purchased usually we have a big ukrainian community here and it's purchased by families whose grandmothers used it <laughs> lovely. And they want copies for all the grandkids, and I like to encourage that. That's lovely. What about uh, books on painting Easter eggs? <laughs> um, I've sold books on, on Pisanki in the last few months, certainly, yeah. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's get back to your biography here. Uh, after several years of part-time tutelage in 2000, the year 2000, she undertook management of the newly opened Bison Books. So was that opened in this uh, location? No, this is Bison Books' third location. Third location, okay, because it's, it's a pretty cool, well, it's right smack in the middle of downtown. Mm -hmm. It's okay. always been downtown. Yeah. This is the third downtown location. Here, she spread her wings and eventually took over becoming a partner in 2007 and assuming sole proprietorship in 2010. In 2018, Amy purchased Greenfield Books and moved the contents into Bison Books, where she endeavors to do justice to the standards of professionalism set by her mentor. Can you talk a little bit more about your mentor? Like, what kind of seller was he? What kind of person was he? Um, Michael was incredibly ethical. Uh, that's one of the things that he really drilled into me. He'd been a lawyer in his career, and he he felt that you know he had he had 
standards of ethics that came from, I think, that profession. Well, let's not get people. too carried away with that. Yeah. <laughs> came from what that profession should be. <laughs> um, Aspired to be, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, um, sometimes to a fault, would, would um, be incredibly ethical and explain things to people. And whether it pleased them or not, he would do the right thing in any situation. And he'd always stand up for what he thought was was right, um, mm -hmm. even if it looked a little weird. You know, you're on the street and you see that someone left their car door open. Well, it's kind of dicey to go up and yeah. start to touch the car door, but th I'm, that's the kind of thing that he would do without mm -hmm. thinking twice. Um, mm -hmm. He was adventurous. He he did book fairs all over the states um, and Canada. And he really encouraged me to do that as well. Um, he'd travel from Christmas to Easter most years. And when I worked at Greenfield Books, I'd be on my own running that place mm -hmm. um, in his absence. And uh, he always said, you know, you got to get out there. And, you gotta, and he would always, he, when I worked for him at Greenfield, he took me to a couple of fairs and showed me the lay of the land. And always strong-armed me into doing the Toronto Book Fair. <laughs> yes, which you, um, what, you prefer not to? No, I, I do enjoy doing it, but, you know, sometimes there's another fair that conflicts, or when I had little little kids, yeah. when they were still too little for me to be away, it was tough sometimes to get away, but, you know, he'd encourage me to, to make the effort to get out there and meet people, and I think it's one of the most important things I've done in my career, to get out of the little fishbowl of Winnipeg and see what the wider world has to offer. You know, you can, you can be here and be a paperback exchange your whole life if you want, or you can break out of the mold. So how's, how's that helped you? I think it's a lot more interesting to see what's going on elsewhere, um, to meet people who want to deal in antiquarian books. Um, even the, the conversations and the dinners are really informative and show you what the possibilities are. Yes, yeah. I, I think that's from my experience talking to booksellers. Is they just got, I mean, because they come across so many interesting ideas and, and uh, they see so many interesting things that it just, they, they, they are just some of the most interesting people you could ever want to meet. Mm -hmm. And there's a thirst, you know, that you're always interested in learning something new and for me anyway that's that's the way that I go with it and there are a lot of people who are happy in their nest and just want to do what they do now yeah um, but that's not what drives me you know I went I remember the first time I walked in the front door of the New York Antiquarian Book Fair I was just dazzled <laughs> yeah yeah um, by what by the incredible level of style mixed with substance you could go through there and see, you know, the, the first booth you see when you walk in is um, handwritten manuscripts. You know, they don't handle printed books at that store. <laughs> and then it's uh, signed modern firsts, but it's only, you know, Fitzgerald and Hemingway. <laughs> right, right. And the next booth is all books in vellum, and the next booth is enormous tomes with hand colored plates of birds you know the the specializations and just the level of of knowledge and um the, you know the museum artifacts that are just available to to, to, to hold to hold and yeah. touch and own yeah you know you yeah. can own this yes that's, <laughs> the, that's a theoretically at yeah. least yeah uh, it's it's amazing so what about style and substance? What do you mean by that? Well, not only is it a book that is full of information that is important to the history of the world, but it is a beautiful object and it right. is presented in a glittering booth in okay. a beautiful building by sophisticated people who yeah. have a bottle of champagne on the counter <laughs> you know there's no yeah. <laughs> yeah. there's nothing missing in that yeah. picture yeah because because what because you see that they're paying attention to everything you know there's nothing there's nothing being left on the table 
They're doing everything with excellence. Right, and obviously you admire that. Yes. Okay, so they've got big brains that they're using to persuade other people what to agree with what they think is important and stylish and good i guess so i yeah that's you know to to show off this artifact which if it was a uh, an oil painting of similar caliber would oh, be far more expensive yeah, yeah, of yeah. course does that mean the dealers the art dealers are better than the book dealers at, no i just think their, art's their more job <laughs> you don't have to read the whole book and know know that whole school of thought in order to know the piece of art is important necessarily or beautiful. Yeah, you know it's it's a little bit easier to present. Mm -hmm. um, you do a lot of reading compared to some. <laughs> 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 okay. I meet a lot of people who read a lot of books. Yeah, so I read every day. So it's so important to a bookseller, I think. Yes. Absolutely. You have to be able to, especially in a, in a shop like this, where you have yeah. to talk to people about books and yeah. recommend things. Yeah. Uh, you can't say, well, this one's popular, like someone would at a, at a retail store in the mall. Mm -hmm. you know, this is yeah. a popular thing. Well, I don't know, want to know what's popular. I no. want to know what's good. Well, yeah, and it also gives you a leg up on finding stuff, too, right? Yeah. That yeah. others may not have seen. Yeah, I mean, if you're reading um, contemporary literature and your competitors aren't and you see it at a book sale, you, mm. you know that it's going to sell, um, and they might not. Okay, that's what we're going to do during this conversation. If, if listeners haven't clued into that yet, I'm just slowly working through your biography. Okay. Okay. So, you will find Amy in the shop most weekdays attending to aspects of the business with a focus on acquisitions, collections development, client relations, and appraisals. So by acquisitions you mean people coming in the door with a bunch of stuff for you to buy or not buy? Yep. Or me going to their house. Or their, as happened to me earlier this week, crawling around the back of their van out front of the shop. That's what I want you to do in my van. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that being a woman helps you or hinders you? It depends on who I'm de dealing with. What's that mean? Well, for some people, they feel a little bit more comfortable. Both. Not as threatened, you mean? Right. Um, there are other people who come in and uh, they'll talk to a male customer that I'm having a conversation with instead of me, just assuming that he's the boss. And that he um, knows more. And that he knows more yeah. than I do. Okay. And for other people, it's just neither here nor there. Right. I think for me, it, it probably shakes out to be pretty uh, unimportant. So do you, do you think it's helped or hindered? Or he, neither? Neither. Uh, okay, next one is collections development. So you ideally you hope to work with uh, people who come into the store who are collectors. Is that it? Yeah, who come into the store or come into my booth at a book fair or um, come to my website to see what I'm about. I buy books at auction for people. Mm -hmm. I will buy a book from overseas and have it imported and they can pay me off in installments. Um, they can tell me what they're looking for and I can keep an eye out for it or give them a list of options. Um, I'm doing more and more of that and I find it really enjoyable to learn about each person's niche because I can't know everything. <laughs> I can't know everything about one subject area and you know these, these folks who are specialists in their area that they, where they collect um, certainly know much more about their area of expertise than I do. So yeah. learning from them mm. is really interesting and fulfilling and allows me to explore certain niches that I wouldn't otherwise be in, in the midst of. What are some of the more exciting collections that you've worked with collectors on? Well, I don't know if I want to give that away, but... <laughs> <laughs> I have a good friend who collects, and he's a local... And he um, was the first person I worked with on that basis. Um, and he's a very serious collector who travels to book fairs. And um, he's developed his own niche in, in the book world as well. well that was you want to name names or not? No, not without his permission. Okay. Okay. <laughs>
Um, do you want to name what the what he collects or not? That would make it obvious. Oh dear. Visual, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not on the record. Not on the record. Old books. He collects old yes. books. Very okay. old books. Very old books. Okay. You mean like 1450 to 1500 kind of old books or? Around 1500. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, client relations is pretty obvious, I guess. Yeah, it can be. Um, I usually have to, when I'm teaching people, say, teaching my employees to buy books, yeah. one of the things that um, I teach them is how to talk to people about their books when you're buying them. You know, you don't start by saying, I'm going to pay, I'm going to offer you $28. Mm -hmm. You start by explaining to them what you're interested in and why and then making the offer. So that's that's one of the relationships that you have to be particularly careful with because some people have ideas about their books. For sure. They all have <laughs> ideas that they're worth more than what you're going to pay them. Yeah, Taj Mahal syndrome. Um, and sometimes I, I use the phrase, you know, this, this item has a lot more sentimental value than monetary value. <laughs> yes. So that's a big part of client relations then? It's just sort of managing expectations, I guess. That's on the buying end, yeah. And sometimes you get to tell them their book is worth a lot more than they thought it was. And that's, that's always exciting. That's great, yeah. Um, and in my shop, I Don't have a lot... Don't think that's ever happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of um, regular customers. And I know them by name. And they might come in twice a week or twice a month. Or right. What have you, but getting to know those people and developing the relationships with them and, and bringing more people into that fold um, is important. And, and it's hard when you first start working to get all the names straight. And, yeah. you know, you, you can tell this person when, when a military book has come in or you can tell that person when a martial arts book has come in. You know, it's knowing that once they become a regular customer that they're going to get that kind of personalized service, I think, is really important. And I think it makes those folks feel like they're seen and understood and appreciated. Yeah. And they are. The mere fact that you've remembered it makes them feel good and yeah, important. Yeah, validated. That's one of my my areas of focus in the shop is making people feel welcome yeah. and seen and respected and validated mm. um, mm -hmm. and comfortable. You know, when they come in the store, I don't want them to feel intimidated or... Um, look down upon because they read mystery novels. You know, yes. Come on in, here's the mystery section, and I have no issues with that. <laughs> well, some of the greatest minds were keen on mystery. Yeah, yeah. I you mean, know. it's um, some of them call them just, you know, beach reading, or, but yeah. it, that's not the limit of it. And that's... if you're reading on the beach, then great. <laughs> I don't care what you're reading, I'm not here to judge you. I think Dylan Thomas was a big detective fiction fan. Oh, was he? Yeah. Now this it, this dates me, but I'm I'm thinking, and in fact, I'm not even sure I'm going to keep this in. But maybe it's just that they're sweet on you, that they love to come in and you know talk to you and be friendly with you. I mean, what what, what do you think about that? Or is that well, is that a, is that a, now, like an inappropriate question? I mean, I I wouldn't have even thought twice about asking that. Maybe twenty years. Well, not even before I started doing mm -hmm. this. Now I'm I'm thinking: is that a stupid question or a off the rec, you know, off the chart type of? <laughs> what do you think? Um, it's a reality. There's this bookseller uh, bookstore bingo that came out on on some Instagram account a couple of years ago, and it made me laugh because one of the bingo squares was a crush on your local bookseller, yes, yes. and it's not me. I'm I'm the old lady around here i've got all these vibrant young people working for me <laughs> it's you and still I, Come you on. know one of them got followed home one day oh, a dear. guy got followed home by a, a woman who had a crush on him and when i was single i dated a couple of customers i mean there's and they always kind of said oh it's the whole there's there's this um fascination with but i think that happens in any any, in any, any business. store or any yeah. business i don't think yeah. it's particular to this one but you did say client relations mm -hmm. so one of one of my to. one of my staff told me once he, we had a discussion about it he said some of these guys that come in here twice a week and they bring you things yes it's when i first started working here i just assumed they all had crushes on me um yeah. because you know one would bring 
donuts, and another would bring me some bring me flowers on the That's store lovely. anniversary. That's... Um, I have one friend who brings in a bottle of scotch on my birthday. These are lovely things. That's more and, lovely. And, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I I really value having these relationships. Sure. And he realized over time, this employee of mine, that these are just nice, kind-hearted people yeah. who probably yeah. are bringing donuts or and, and maybe they are in love to, with you it's not necessarily just me uh, no. you know once the the donut bringer gets to know my staff members he, they get donuts also you know right it's not, right right okay. it's not necessarily focused they're just trying to support a, a store that's of some value to them very good now finally you you mentioned attending to aspects of appraisals so what is it here in Winnipeg? It's the universities that ask you to appraise or or retain you or what? Yeah, sometimes it's just for private people. Um, for insurance purposes? For insurance purposes or because they're just interested in knowing what their thing is worth. I get a lot of emails and phone calls asking me to tell them, to ask people yeah. asking me to tell them how what much their is thing worth. is worth. Yeah. yeah. So it's, how do you go about doing that? Well, I usually say I'm happy to make you an offer on the book if you're interested in selling it. And if you would like me to carry out an appraisal on the book, you you're to welcome me. to leave me a deposit. <laughs> and, uh, okay. and then I'll do that for you. And usually I don't yeah. hear from them ever again. I don't work for free. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, yeah. I, if I'm going to spend an hour researching your book, you have to pay me to do that. I have, you know, mouths to feed. Okay. On behalf of Buys and Books, uh, Amy has exhibited at book fairs in Toronto, Vancouver, Ottawa, New York, and California. She's also attended affairs in Boston and Paris and participated in the 2018 iLab Congress in Pasadena. Okay, so tell me about Paris. Oh, Paris is, is um, New York, but more. More of everything. A fancier location, um, better food. <laughs> it was, I found it quite intimidating. Was that? Yes, I did. You didn't. You didn't understand the books, or you didn't know what they had, or, or or what. To some extent, it was much more naturally uh, foreign because there were books in other languages yes. and books that I wasn't familiar with, and booksellers that I had never heard of, who are well known over there. I mean, it's it's just a different world. North America is very American centric, and I know Canada quite well because that's my small pond yeah um, so going over there it's just unfamiliar it was like jumping in with both feet into a, a new pond <laughs> um that and was it, good, i mean I guess. The, the, it. the grand palais is spectacular yeah and just seeing the kinds of things that were on exhibit was was amazing <laughs> but it was it was a, a different stratosphere than what i'm accustomed to you know, there's quite a few uh, sellers who will go over to Europe and scoop up a bunch of interesting stuff and, and make good money off off that, selling it here. I'm not sure they're buying it at the Grand Palais. <laughs> they're not buying it there, definitely not. They've already, that's they're already buying it on found. the streets, the, uh, yeah, yeah, in the, in the in, little shops, yes. and, yeah, and so on. Yeah. Man, that sounds like fun, right? Eh? It does indeed, yeah. So your Paris experience was intimidating, but but what else? Oh, it was wonderful. Did you it buy stuff there? Or? I didn't buy. No, I, I was I was there as a tourist. As a tourist, and there was okay. nothing that I could buy and bring back to Winnipeg and resell for more. I was at the limit of my carry on, so Been there. I couldn't just buy. But I I brought what I needed to read, and that was about all I all okay. I could handle. Now tell me about the iLab Congress in Pasadena. What was that all about? Oh, it's, um, I, with a couple of the other dealers in attendance, we, we called it the Nerd Jamboree. Um, it was amazing. Just a wonderful week. One of the yeah. highlights of my career so far. I'd like to go to another Congress or two if I can manage it. But, um, you know, you get up in the morning and, and uh, get on the bus and go to the Getty. And get that was a all tour organized, the was it? And yeah. you're not you're not just going to the library. You're going to the vault, and the, yeah. the the head curator is the one who's giving you the tour. I mean, it's just amazing. And in the afternoon, you go to a a private library in a house that just made your jaw drop, and you'd see books that that you never thought you would see. 
and that's just one day, and then you go out for dinner with all the booksellers. That's fine. And that's a great time, too. Right. And it just day after day of this kind of razzle-dazzle and whining and dining. Okay, so it's, it's an itinerary that's put together for you. It is an itinerary, you. yeah. As a it's member a bus of, tour. As a member. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I see. Plus, there's a book fair, is there, there? Then there, there was a book fair following, yeah. And the, even just the time on the bus yeah. with the other dealers yeah. was wonderful. Isn't it? I mean, it's so true. You get together with a bunch of other dealers, and it's like you can't find more interesting group of people. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. And unassuming. You know, there were people there that I, I had um, heard of or admired from afar, and, and yeah. they're all just easy to talk to. And I mean, we're all sitting around a table having a meal. And so I yes. guess that, that breaks the ice. There was, wasn't was anybody who was stuck up or unwilling Good. to share their experience. or uh, Yeah, it was just a really wonderful experience. So you are currently the president of the Winnipeg Association of Secondhand Bookstores. Yes. That's different from the uh, Antiquarian Booksellers Association of Canada. Right. So yeah. it's the local secondhand booksellers association. I see. How many are there? Actually, Winnipeg has more bookstores than any other city in Canada. The last time I checked, more open shops. Um, we've got two universities, and our rents are mm. are okay yeah. in some areas yeah. of the city. Yeah, I think that the, those two things really um, foster a, a great book community. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how many members we have at the moment, but it's in the te in the high teens. You know, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. There are um, a bunch of different models within that association and a couple of stores locally that aren't members as well. So what's the difference between uh, the second handbook sellers and the antiquarian association sellers? Well, the second handbook sellers locally, that can include... I mean personality-wise. Oh, per personality-wise? Nothing. There's no difference. They're just, uh, it's like herding a bunch of uh, highly intellectual <laughs> cats. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly independent minded guests. Right, right. Okay, you also manage Dominion Auctions, which is very interesting. It's a long established and well reputed art and antique auction house, which also offers appraisal and estate dissolution services. So you do know the art market then, locally at least. A little bit, yeah. How does that compare to the book side of things? It's a very different business model. It's it's apples and oranges because uh, at the auction we sell on consignment, um, and we know what we will accept and what we won't accept. We take in X number of items, and then we have an auction, and then we have no inventory after the auction. So it's not like my shop where I currently own twenty thousand books that I hope I can sell quickly enough yes. <laughs> to pay the bills. Um, right. Over there, it's just a con commission consignment arrangement okay. and um, you sell any books on consignment or not you don't go there not really no, no. The, um i've tried books and they don't it, sometimes if we have a canadian art auction i'll sell a canadian art book if i have a duplicate copy or something like that but it's okay. a lot better when we were having the auctions in per in person than it yeah. is now that they're all online because of covid business wise it's 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 better in person not necessarily. Some things are better and some things are worse. So you don't auction any books off then? No, not very often. Why Why not? The, I mean, book auctions are successful. Book auctions are successful, but we don't do book auctions. There's not really enough. Um, we've never had enough of a critical mass to do a book auction or the confidence to do such a thing here. Oh, okay. um, we have uh, hmm. tried and true market for art and jewelry, hmm. some furniture collectibles, um, those kinds of things, but um, we, we don't sell batches of books or um, so sometimes local auctions will do that if they're selling an estate, you know, they're selling the contents of drawers and sh and shelves and there will be a box of books that you can pick up, um, but we don't sell them very often. Might be a, a lot of books in every couple of, every two or second auction or so, but not much. Any other reflections on the difference between selling art and selling books? I think there are some similarities in that, um, you know, with the increase in internet e-commerce, 
the things that are common or not very sought after have just the bottom has fallen out of the market um, for for a lot of common stuff and there's but there's no ceiling for the stuff that's rare you can reach more people now and we're getting higher prices for the stuff that's high that's end. more that's high end yeah um, increasingly also it's the same in terms of what's fashionable you know there are certain things you can't sell that just almost immediately are obsolete and it's the same thing with the auction you can have a, a spectacular piece of furniture from 120 years ago that nobody wants because it doesn't go with their living room you know it, and you can't sell it it's it if you're trying to get 100 bucks for it and no one will put their hand up it's amazing sometimes it's a shame it and just you goes in you waves tell people what to buy yeah yeah like every couple of years or you mean you're no the... no long-term um trends when when i started helping out with this auction business which um, was the family business of my ex-husband actually, okay. um, and he still runs the business, and I work with him. That's but when good. I first, yeah, I like that. <laughs> when I first started working there, um, uh, twenty-five years ago, they could sell plush furniture and that right. kind of thing, right. and there was not a piece of teak in sight. The word mid-century never, never went into the catalog. Right. And now right. it's really flipped. Over that period of time, you can't. You're not going to sell an embroidered. Um, ottoman <laughs> and no. embroidered floral ottoman is just not going to sell. You need a, a Madman uh, series for the other kind of yeah. furniture, <laughs> yeah, right? for the older stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I'm sure it'll come back. It's it's beautiful and, and yeah. has intrinsic value. You can't even buy the wood anymore. Well, now it's the time to buy it. You can't find the... anyone to carve it. Yeah, that's for sure. Long term, I do think there will be a market for that stuff. I can't store it for 25 years until it comes back. So you just have to hope enough of it stays around for the, when the market comes back. Okay, outside of her work life, she's a dedicated mom to two beautiful kids. Are they into books? Yeah. Yeah, they're very into books. My son has recently started uh, learning about Greek mythology. And uh, he's teaching me quite a lot, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So he's curious. That's key. Yeah, yeah. And so is my daughter. She's been tearing through series recently. Like what? Um, they're um, dystopian <laughs> um, adolescent she? series. She's 12. 12, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to get her into some some of the books that I think she could access, like Animal Farm. I, I think I have that on her bedside table at the moment. <laughs> not sure she. You're hand selling it. her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try this. Yeah. So you, you're gonna love this. Yeah. <laughs> so you love cooking and good restaurants. Are there any good restaurants in uh, Winnipeg? Winnipeg has wonderful restaurants. Okay. Yeah, so what we're are the well known for what are the best? I mean, there's Highs, which is famous. Highs is famous if you want kind of a standard steak. It's yeah. A, it's a good place to go. Pricey, but good. Yeah. Um, on, along the same lines as Highs is Ray and Jerry's, which has the vintage um, red leather booths and yes. um, food that is not my favorite, but a lot of Heart people attack food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not my jam. One of my favorite restaurants in the city is called Enoteca, and it's okay. small plates. Um, it's beautiful food. And you can get wine pairings with it. There's a um, a wonderful brunch restaurant in the exchange called Clementine that okay. won a, a, a national award at one point. Um, Deer and Almond. Um, they're great ethnic restaurants. There's one just sur around the corner called Ban Mi King that we order from all the time here. Um, a great cafe across the street, which has been closed for a while due to COVID. Um, but the best coffee in the city, in my opinion. Um, That's the, uh, what's it called again, Tom? Bargain. B-A-R-G-E-N. They have three locations in the city. One of them is still open, but the one across the street, sadly, is closed for the time being. Well, because <laughs> you mentioned it to me, I drove out there and grabbed a cup of coffee oh, from did them you? just because I wanted the win the taste of Winnipeg. Yeah, yeah, they roast so. all their own beans. and yeah. Um, yeah. They do taste, and I think, monthly or weekly taste tests to make sure everything's on, on point, which I really appreciate that 
that commitment <laughs> to the details, <laughs> as we were <laughs> mentioning earlier about the New York Fair. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's a really good uh, way to sort of wrap things up here. You have an affinity for scotch and wine. <laughs> so what's your favorite scotch then? Lagavulin. Mm. 18. <laughs> <laughs> All day. Okay. That's I keep trying to good. find a replacement, but I <laughs> nothing holds a candle. That's smoky, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing quite like the smoke. No, no. And then you ha I have flavor memories the next day <laughs> of the peat. Yeah. I li yeah, I like uh, smoky scotch and stout beer and and books. My friends joke that I'm... And I, I drive a Cadillac. All my friends joke that I'm an old man in the body of a middle-aged woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just drive around Winnipeg in that Cadillac, I yeah. guess, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't drive across the country like I am. No, no, yeah. I'd like to. Very good. And finally, you like or try to keep more or less fit. Yes. So how do you do that? I'm a, I'm a bit of a health nut. Um, I'm up these days four to six mornings a week. I work out for oh 45 to 60 minutes. <laughs> how many times a week? Four to six times a week. And what do you mean work out, Jesus? What do you do? Well, I used to go to the gym, but now I've kind of developed a routine in my basement. I've got weights and YouTube videos and... Well, wow. um, I'm quite planful about it. I like to progress and then I'll have a green protein smoothie for breakfast. And, uh, there's nothing I can't tackle after that. Start. A friend of mine, uh, Richard Minsky, he started to, uh, where he, I don't know. I think he started a bit earlier, but he said to me that he had a friend who lived into his nineties, who didn't start working out till he was 67. So I've got a few years to wait. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> not that uh, not that it isn't very very good for you yeah obviously yeah. it's and good for your body and your mind yes for sure sometime I, when I was at the gym I just like to put my earphones in and I'd be in a bit of a bubble and it gives me a bit of a break and uh, a lot of people think they don't have the energy to work out but I don't have enough energy if I don't gives you more energy doesn't it it does yeah, yeah. wakes you up in the morning too well, we've come to the end of your biography. Oh, I hope it doesn't so, mean I'm dead. <laughs> it's the no, end no, of the life. No, it's been very lively. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me ad hoc like this. It's my pleasure. Worked out well, I think. Very good. I do too. So, I've been talking to Amy Peake, who is the proprietor of Bison Books in Winnipeg, Manitoba where we are currently today. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you.